Welcome to the Damage Report. I'm John Adarola. And I'm Francesca Fiorentini, host of the Bituation Room podcast, which isn't this show. It's not, but it's a great show. And it actually just happened yesterday. Uh, briefly, what, what, what happened on the Bituation Room? Um, well, it was pre slap. You know, there is a pre slap, post slap world. Mm -hmm. um, but we did have uh, John Marco Cerezi, a comedian, on. We talked all about uh, Clarence Thomas and KBJ. And then we had Victoria Law, uh, who is an author of Prisons Keep Us Safer and 20 Other Myths About Mass Incarceration. And it's mm -hmm. such a great book, and she's excellent. So, everybody, check that out. I actually really want to read that book now. Uh, but yeah, very glad to have you on. Very exciting, everyone. Check out the Bituation Room. This is the Damage Report, though, your daily breakdown of you know whatever stuff that happens, <laughs> uh, including slap. No slap lawsuits. That's for John Oliver to cover. But we will be talking about the slap. Um, but anyway, we got a lot that we're going to be talking about. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Not only the stuff coming out of the Oscars, the slap, but more so, we'll be uh, critiquing people's outfits. There were some bold choices. Did you know shorts are back? And Timothy Chalamet. Shirtless, everybody. Mm. But anyway, um, this is, that was serious news that was coming across my newsfeed. Uh, but we've got dueling tax plans, including a right wing tax plan that. So there are new taxes in it. I want you to guess who gets taxed <laughs> in the new GOP tax plan. It's fascinating. Uh, Chris Wallace explaining why he fled Fox News. We've got people freaking out at Jack in the Box, and not just over how good those tacos are. And a lot of other stuff besides. So everyone, I'm gonna need you to buckle up, hold on to your butts. We've got a lot of news coming at you. And before that, hit the like button, share the stream, so that people know we're live. And with all that said, Francesca, are you ready to talk about some news? I think so. I think so. Well, we're about to. I see people doing the "What did the five fingers say in the face" thing. So I think they're ready as well. Let's jump into it. <laughs> oh, wow! Wow! Will Smith just smacked the shit out of me. Your Th wife's name out your mouth. Wow, dude. Yeah. It was a G.I. Jane joke. Keep my wife's G. I. Jane no joke out your this. mouth. I'm going to, okay? So that, of course, was from last night's Oscars. You're hearing it here first. Will Smith slapped Chris Rock. Did you know that? A lot of people watched it and missed that part of it. But no, it was very serious. Like he, uh, there was a joke from Chris Rock, which we're going to play in just a second. And as a result, Will Smith, who would go on to win an Oscar that night, walked up on stage and slapped him about as hard as a slap can land. It sounded like a punch. That's how hard of a slap it was, Francesca. Yeah, I mean, I know we're gonna talk about it, but every time I see the footage, it's jarring. It is incredibly jarring and it is scary to me to see somebody walk up to someone else on stage um, and and just hit them. Like, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm, I'm just, I'm like still kind of stunned and immediately like uh, just completely taken aback. Um, I think yeah. there's been a lot of jokes made on this. But mostly, I'm just like jaw on the floor. Did that just happen? Exactly. Yeah, and there, there might be some jokes coming up. But um, but yeah, because you you think about <laughs> like from Chris Rock's perspective, he sees Will Smith get up and start to walk, and he doesn't know is Will Smith going to come up and say something? Is he going to come up and I don't know? I doubt high up on the list of predictions was he's about to strike me really hard. Remember, he played Ali. In a movie, yeah, um, and he wound up and full on slapped him. So, but but let's get to what led to this. So the joke that preceded the slap, right here. Jada, I love you. GI Jane too. Can't wait to see it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, that was a that was a nice one. Okay, I'm out here. Uh oh, Richard. <laughs> The laughing stopped shortly thereafter. Uh, so you saw the joke. It was a joke about Jada Pickett Smith uh, potentially starring in G.I. Jane because she had her head shaved there. Uh, as I think everyone in the country now knows, I think maybe a lot of people knew before it. I don't know if Chris Rock did. She suffers from alopecia, an autoimmune disorder that causes hair loss. And uh, I think understandably doesn't think that it's hilarious for a joke. So she she rolled her eyes and Francesca, a lot of people have noted that in the footage, initially Will Smith laughs at the joke. She didn't receive it well, and then his response came 
Um, you're you're a professional funny person. What do you think about this as a choice? Like, it's hardly the most devastating joke we've heard from a host of the Oscars before. I mean, Ricky Gervais's like that was nicer than anything Ricky Gervais said. Um, oh my so god! So what do you think about all this? <clears throat> I do think it is you know complicated, and I absolutely understand that suffering from alopecia is not a joke, right? And and in a in a normal world, right, we do not make fun of folks who have autoimmune disorders, it's in poor yeah. taste, etc. That being said, we're at the Oscars. Chris Rock is one of the most famous comedians in our country, if not the world. He Ever. made not only a joke, but like a bad old reference joke, G.I. Jane. I was like, wait a minute, is G.I. Jane 2 coming out for real? That was my first reaction. And you're like, you have to expect that this is a couple that puts all of their uh, dirty laundry, so to speak, in front of everybody. They get paid millions to talk around their red table talk about their open relationship, about you know past hurts, about everything, about family yeah. drama. And here you have Chris Rock making a stupid joke. Yeah, sure. And then he gets struck for it and nothing happens. Like, I just, I think it was absolutely an overreaction. Absolutely yeah. an overreaction. And I do not think that the response to someone making fun of a, of, yeah, you can call it a disability or an autoimmune disorder. I don't think the response is a slap. Like, my thing is, you know, we were even discussing whether like it was okay to hit Richard Spencer. Remember that? Remember there were some people like, mm -hmm. I don't know. And you're like, no, 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 no. Nazis okay. Comedian doing his job on a softball yeah. joke. I just I can't joke, see yeah, it another yeah. way. Yeah, and I, like I don't like the joke. Again, like a lot of people have a lot of different problems about it. Not only because it's targeting an auto a literal autoimmune disorder, but it's seen as both misogynistic and all like and, and then obviously there's a lot of ongoing social stuff about black women's hair to begin with. And he did a movie called Good Hair and now he's mocking her for the fact that she has to do a short. It's just, it's a complicated thing obviously. And there's a few other wrinkles we're gonna get to, but I wanna make sure that you know the context of what ended up happening, which is that despite that, and then the show just sort of continued. Like everyone kind of protect, like in the room, everyone's like nothing happened. On Twitter, obviously it blew up. But he did go on to finally win an Oscar after a lot of great movies and everything for King Richard, which I saw and I thought he was legitimately very good. So anyway, here is what happened when he went up to accept that. Richard Williams um, was a fierce defender of his family. Yes. Denzel said to me a few minutes ago, he said, at your highest moment, be careful. That's when the devil comes for you. So apparently Denzel Washington had uh, consoled Will Smith. That's what all the news said was that it consoled, he consoled Will Smith after. I don't generally think of him as the person who needs to be consoled <laughs> following that. Like I think Chris Rock needs to be consoled. Jada needs to be consoled potentially. I think he's the least that needs to be consoled. But Denzel did talk to him and you got that message. He goes on to say, uh, Will Smith, I want to apologize to the Academy. I want to apologize to all my fellow nominees. This is a beautiful moment and I'm not crying for winning an award. It's not about winning an award for me. It's about being able to shine a light on all of the people. Um, and the Academy said, we don't condone violence of any form. Uh, Chris Rock is not pressing charges against him. Um, some people who'd previously, like I saw, uh, Ayanna Presley had a tweet about alopecia and the immediate reaction to it, which seemed very supportive of what happened. She has since put out another tweet saying, that she doesn't support. I'm a survivor, I don't endorse violence in any form. So she had mm -hmm. taken down the earlier one. Now I wanna add a little bit of context. Not a lot of people necessarily remember this, but Chris Rock had previously hosted the Oscars and made jokes about this couple back in 2016. He joked about Pinkett Smith and her husband boycotting over hashtag Oscars so white. Rock declared that the Smiths as well as black director Spike Lee went mad over the issue as there were no black acting nominees that year. And he said, quote, Jada boycotting the Oscars is like me boycotting Rihanna's panties. I wasn't invited. And then he goes on to say, Jada's matter man Will was not nominated for concussion. I get it, it's not fair that Will was this good and didn't get nominated. It's also not fair that Will was paid $20 million for Wild Wild West. So he had previously made jokes about that, but again, they, they are jokes. And like, I don't necessarily like some of these, but 
you know, Ricky Gervais was joking about people's like history of alcoholism and drug abuse and things like that. Like this is yeah, hardly was- the farthest it's gone, and you do not <laughs> like you don't walk on stage literally anywhere to attack a performer. But you would think in the Oscars it would be the last place to happen, Francesca. I just, I, I mean, look. Here's what I will say in Will Smith's defense. Uh, I have a huge temper as well. I have a crazy temper. You do? Some, I do. It doesn't seem like it, but I, I can, it. I can go off. You know what I mean? I can go off and get real mad. Someone pushes a button. Uh, my brother knows what I'm talking about, right? You know, mm. siblings, siblings always know. I've gotten really mad. I've yelled, and I've, I've not hit. Well, I did throw pesto in his face one time. That was fun. Um, but like. I get when you get mad at, yeah, yeah, I wish. Um, I get when you get mad and then I think those tears are such tears of guilt. Like, oh man, I kind of feel terrible about what I just did. Yeah. But it's it's heightened emotion, right? You got in, you got in a space, you got in your head, you didn't count to 10. I don't know if he's, you know, if he is in the church of Scientology, yikes, because you need therapy. I mean, we all need therapy. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> this like 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 the Thetans, this ain't Thetans, man. This is just you having a temper and you need to calm down. And the other thing I'm gonna say is this is a mega rich multi-million dollar couple. It's Jada Pinkett yes. Smith. She is fine. I understand that she has an autoimmune disorder. She's also a millionaire and she will be fine. She will turn sure. this around and monetize this moment and make Hand over fist money. That is a, that is just facts. Same with Will Smith. Chris Rock also a millionaire. Also, but like not a not a like movie star, mega movie star. It's just the peak fragility. I understand people have to have thick skin, and he, you know, Will Smith was like, we're supp- expected to have thick skin. I totally agree with that. I don't think it's right to like yell at celebrities in the street or have a pile on mm-hmm. for no reason in the media, but like. One joke, you're in the front row, man. That yeah. means you're you just won an Oscar, bro. Like, or so least you're nominated. Like, you're you're as high yeah. profile as it gets. And yeah, I I don't think. I mean, was it about the joke? Yes, it was about the joke. Was it totally about the joke? No. I I think there's a lot that's feeding into that. I think that is the spark. The fuel was there. But um, you know, in real time. Uh, everyone across the country was reacting to what happened at the Oscars. And so I wanna just reveal a few of those reactions in real time. I was doing my writing group, my wife texted me that it had happened. And I thought, well, she's clearly exaggerating what happened or <laughs> it was a joke. Nope, she wasn't exaggerating. She was underselling it to some extent. But um, Sitting Bull tweeted uh, the people that were sitting next to Will Smith and laughed at that joke. And it's a photo <laughs> of them receding into the background. Um, Sam Brody is interacting with other people before the pandemic versus interacting with people after. Like, yes, it had been much more collegial earlier so on. True. Duncan Jones <laughs> put a bug in every limo in Hollywood tonight because a lot of celebrities were asked by like Variety and other places about it, but they're being very careful. Would have been fascinated to hear their true thoughts about that. Uh, one of my favorite comedians tweeted, now I need to see Kim Cattrall beat the S out of <laughs> Reach Your Face. And that's Francesca, and that's hilarious. I like, I like Ricky Gervais. I, li- I, well, I like his, I like his oh shows. I think his comedy is not necessarily great. It's a little bit his acting, but I think his show isn't great. Good. Yes, but, but he, I will say, I go back and watch his Golden Globes performance multiple times Those are good. a year. Like, at least once yeah. a year, I'm like, I'm going to go back and watch this. And yeah, he like lays into the entire cast of Sex in the City. He's like best makeup or artist or whatever is like whoever did the work on those ladies. Like you, we know you're not 40. You know, just being really ageist and sexist and whatever. And they took it. I mean, they weren't like happy, you know, but it was like they didn't look. Anyone who says women are emotional, even though I just said that I get very hot headed, like, come on. You know what yeah. I'm saying? And if it were That's a woman, true. Oh my God, ladies, do, can you imagine if it was like one of us? We would have been like, oh, I was on my rag, like super PMSy. That's exactly what I would have oh, said. No, no. I would have been like, okay, I was gonna get to that, but let, let's pause on this. Obviously, look, <laughs> this is this is a big thing. It's Will Smith as Chris Rock. The fact that they're not just you know at the Oscars, but they're among the biggest stars in the world or whatever. Uh, in this case, they're both black men. You change any other facet of this demographically, like like if it had been. Emma Stone (laughs) slapping Jessica Chastain. If it had been Will Smith slapping Chris Pratt, right? Like, like 
it is already obviously, uh, there's a lot of discourse, I will say. Um, but in some ways, I think we avoided some of the worst. Like the right is already gonna be terrible when it comes to this. But but anyway, I appreciate your comment. Um, the Lucas Bro says, every comedian should post a Will Smith joke in solidarity with Chris Rock. I'm not, but every other comedian should. <laughs> That's not bad. And Kathy Griffin, I think with a serious point saying, let me tell you something. It's a very bad practice to walk up on stage and physically assault a comedian. Now we all have to worry about who wants to be the next Will Smith in comedy clubs and theaters. Especially because look, there are a lot of people who think that what happened was awesome. Not just dramatic yes. or entertaining, but awesome. He's defending his wife in some form, but he's also assaulting a performer. There are a lot of people who are a lot less worried than Will Smith off camera assaulting someone potentially. So I am worried about, like we already see flight attendants and bartenders and people working at Panera are routinely getting harassed and assaulted for just doing their job. I am a little bit worried about the ripple effects from this Francesca. What about you, you perform on stage? Well, it, it happens frequently. I mean, that someone is asked to leave because they're heckling, they're being too loud, they're being aggressive. And sometimes those people even try and rush the stage like that. Not it has not, thank God, happened to me, knock on wood. But it definitely has happened. People like suddenly again, there is no barrier between performance, performer, and the audience. People are like, ah, oh, it's my entire Netflix screen. I'm gonna get up in your face, you know? And mm -hmm. so, and especially now, you know, I know people and I've done benefit shows for like things like you know, abortion rights and and, and pro-choice causes. And I think there's a lot of people, nine times out of ten, performers are women. And there's some fear. There's some like, look, we don't know yeah. in this day and age the number of people who are armed, who are open carry. God, every state in essentially is an open carry state. What are we like up to like 30 yeah. now? Yeah. Who knows who's armed? And people aren't walking through metal detectors when they get into most comedy clubs. So, yeah. and it, even if like, so it is really scary. It is a very, very scary time. And I totally agree with Kathy, Griff Kathy Griffin that like someone will think that they can just do that. Um, and and like, will Chris Rock go to Will Smith's next, you know, <laughs> next like movie <laughs> filming and go to the trailer and just smack him? He's doing his job. He's doing his yeah. job. Yeah, exactly. Uh, also, want to give credit to a friend of the show, Ken Klippenstein, who tweeted, uh, "I am calling for a no-fly zone around Chris Rock." It's funny <laughs> and timely. Um, and I also saw someone. I don't remember who it was, but they just tweeted, "I got in one little fight and my mom got scared." That's pretty funny. I so mean, good. That's funny. Anyway, with that said, we're gonna take our first break. We come back, dueling tax plans. Joe Biden's got a pretty bold one that he totally, I'm sure, is gonna fight for. And the GOP's awful tax plan and a whole lot more besides after this. Let me just briefly say, guys, I, like I understand you're not gonna always love everything that we choose to cover. I, I, I choose for the rundown what I find interesting. I apologize. Like we. We're doing a wage inequality story. We're gonna do tax plans in just a sec. How many times have I talked about the Thwaites Glacier? And see, like, sometimes I just want to come out of the weekend and talk about something that I found interesting. I apologize. Yeah, don't. Be We're not so doing it because we feel we have to. I choose a rundown based on what I'm interested in. Don't be so joyless and irrelevant, you guys. This is how the left loses. Everyone's talking about it. Let's talk about it. Yeah, and by the way, you're you're told. I I love that you have preferences. I'm not saying not to have preferences or anything, and I want you to express it. But like, occasionally. This is my life. Like it's there's a lot harder jobs. I've had them, but um, but we we have to do stuff like you know. To, John to needs a little break. Like <laughs> yeah. you know, like everybody will say like thanks for keeping me sane. I'm also trying to keep me sane. <laughs> so <laughs> it's entertaining, people. I apologize. Thank you for the feedback. I love y'all. I love the 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 feedback, including criticism. But for now, this. You recently put out an 11 point plan to rescue America, two of the big points of which are, quote, all Americans should pay some income tax to have skin in the game, even if a small amount. Currently, over half of Americans pay no income tax. It also says all federal legislation sunsets in five years. If a law is worth keeping, Congress can pass it again. So that would raise taxes on half of Americans and potentially sunset programs like Medicare Medicaid and Social Security. Why would you propose something like that in an election year? Sure, well, John. That's of course the Democrat talking points. It's a no, no, it's plan. in the plan. 
It's in well, the plan. But, he, here's, here, but here's the thing about reality for a second. It's First of all, let's talk but, about but, but Medicare. Senator, but Senator, Wait, hang on. John. And, so it's not a Democratic talking point. It's in the plan. Yeah, yeah. and uh, the Grim Reaper there didn't have a good answer for that. That was a tough question uh, coming from uh, a Fox. It was John Roberts? His name John Roberts, I think. Anyway, John Roberts, um, probably because the, the Republican establishment apparently not big fans of Rick Scott's tax plan there, as we'll get into. But the idea of launching into the election season as the as the right tries to brand itself as populist, literally raising taxes on the poorest people in America, including millions and millions and millions of poor conservatives. Is an interesting idea. Uh, getting rid of Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, all these programs that look, Rick Scott is not alone as a Republican in hating these and wanting to destroy them, but most of them are savvy enough to know that that's not going to be popular with their base. But Rick Scott, he's beyond all this. He doesn't care that uh, an estimate from the taxation, the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy says that Scott's plan would increase taxes by more than $1,000 on average for the poorest 40% of Americans. Poorest 40% of Americans, I've always thought, have way too much of a financial buffer between them and economic catastrophe. Let's cut that down by $1,000. By the way, how it would affect Republican, like Republican strongholds. States where more than 40% of residents would face tax increases are Mississippi, West Virginia, Arkansas, Louisiana, Alabama, Kentucky, Oklahoma, Georgia, New Mexico, South Carolina, and Florida, where he's a senator. So at least admittedly, he's subjecting his own constituents to it. Francesca, what do you think? I mean, cue the lady in Starbucks who went off on him that day when he had the gall to show his face and she just screamed at him <laughs> and was like, you ruined this state. And one of the things is, you know, that she was talking about, she's from Florida and everyone was on board that was in that Starbucks was like that Rick Scott has done things when he was a governor of Florida, like refusing to expand Medicaid, which yep. Again, is covered by 90% by the federal government under Obamacare. But because they can't go for anything that that a Democrat proposed, and especially not Obama, Republicans still hold out on the poorest and most vulnerable people in their states. It's insane. It is it is punishment. And so now to turn around and be like, these people who I have denied health care to affordable health care or free health care to for years. I'm gonna charge them even more because they're not paying enough in taxes. Or they're not paying anything in taxes. It's like mm -hmm. it, it blows my mind. I mean, and to think like $1,000 might not seem like a lot. But again, we, again, I keep on coming back to the $400 unforeseen expense. And yeah. if your taxes go up a one year to the next by $1,000, well, that's food coming off your table straight up. Yeah, exactly. They always cite the like the four hundred dollars that a significant percentage couldn't like a catastrophe. Republican governance is two and a half catastrophes a year. Just in this, like, forget everything else. Um, and then to hide behind, well, those are just Democrat talking points, dude. You wrote the plan, and bear in mind, yeah. it's not just that. Like, if you dig into the bill on page seven hundred, you discover these horrible things going on. We covered, what was it one month ago, two months ago, his little write up of like the top 20 points about it. He was enthusiastic about all this. You can't then say that this is like a plot that like Rachel Maddow and John Oliver cooked up to right. kill your plan. You were advertising it, buddy. But anyway, he is going to be asked some follow up questions about the sunsetting part. Let's take a look at that. You said not everyone agrees with it. And one of the people that doesn't agree with it is Mitch McConnell. Here's what he said. Let me tell you what would not be a part of our agenda. We will not have as part of our agenda a bill that raises taxes on half of the American people and sunsets Social Security and Medicare within five years. That will not be part of a Republican Senate majority agenda. Now, a few days after he said that, you penned a Wall Street Journal op-ed about your plan titled Why I'm Defying Beltway Cowardice. Are you calling Mitch McConnell a coward? <laughs> God, uh, I guess he is. And, and look, for the right wing base, he's supposed to attack Mitch McConnell. They don't like Mitch McConnell. But in this case, the, the old crow 
has a point. This would be like, imagine if, if more Republicans signed on to this plan. That's the Democratic strategy right there. They want to raise your taxes by $1,000. They want to raise your taxes by $1,000. They want to raise it by $1,000. Oh, and by the way, your sweet old grandma, uh, yeah, she's going to be starving because she's not going to have social social security. She's <laughs> not going to have Medicare. All those great programs that have stopped us from having an epidemic of senior citizens just needlessly passing away every winter. Yeah, he wants to get rid of those. Honestly, Rick Scott, like, dude, dude go off. Just do your thing. I, I hope yeah, you get a lot of support. Go for it. I love, you know, you're so right. Old crow, old turtle is correct. I mean, he understands mm -hmm. he might be evil, but he understands what things are politically unpopular, right? Just like that's why he'll he went along with Trumpism essentially. I mean, Trump was a perfect Trojan horse for him and has been because it's popular. And then when he feels like he has to be like, well, it's not good to overthrow an election, you know, whatever. And <laughs> but then you know, this he's like, no, no, you're insane. If you think that you can get away with taking away Social Security and Medicare, you're crazy. These are also yeah. all things that were called socialists when they were floated by Democrats, right? Um, and look where we are now. These are wildly popular, right? Yeah. Now, here's the problem, John. We've got our Democrats, we've got the Democrats we've got. So, That's true. my guess is. They could get away with something like this, and Democrats wouldn't even pick up that mantle of, hey, look who actually raised your taxes. All we wanted to do was raise taxes on corporations, millionaires, and billionaires, and make our tax structure fair. And, but like these guys, they don't even know what they're doing. They don't have strategy. Yeah, well, here's what they would do they do the same thing that they're doing as we uh, careen towards Roe v. Wade being overturned. Like, Hmm, that's bad, but it's something to run against after they've nuked it. I'm so Thanks. mad. That's I don't. Great, Democrats. John, don't get me. Let's talk about the slap again. You're getting me mad. Okay. Exactly. No. Um, let's talk about the slap that Biden wants to give to the millionaires and the billionaires, <laughs> supposedly. So, this is his plan, by the way. He wants to unveil a new minimum tax on billionaires in his budget. Okay. You have my curiosity. The White House will unveil a new minimum tax as part of its 2023 budget uh, today. Proposing a tax on the richest 700 Americans for the first time, according to five people with knowledge on the matter and an administration document obtained by the Washington Post. The billionaire minimum income tax plan under President Biden would establish a 20% minimum tax rate on all American households worth more than $100 million. That is such a high threshold. The majority of new revenue raised by the tax would come from billionaires, obviously. White House officials estimate the tax would raise roughly $360 billion in new revenue over the next 10 years if <laughs> enacted. The proposal was developed by Biden aides at the OMB, the Treasury Department, and the White House National Economic Council. And that is, look, that is not a wealth tax. This is not the stuff we've been talking about over the past few years. It's an income tax. And again, the, 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 the con that they've gotten away with for a very long time is when you are worth hundreds of millions of dollars and billions of dollars, your income isn't the thing that you're making most money off of. That's not actually how it works, but it would be something. The issue is, I think, and Francesca, feel free to disagree. Well, they have five people familiar with that matter, the tax. I have some people who are familiar with the composition of the Senate. Yeah. And of Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin, who I've checked, let me Google it, are <laughs> still alive and drawing breath. <laughs> so not exactly sure what the chances are for this thing, but what do you think? Isn't it amazing? They've got they're just sort of the like two harbingers of death. Like one doesn't want to raise taxes on anybody. One doesn't want any more social safety pro, a safety net. And like they've nope. just got it's like a Chinese finger trap situation here. And that's <laughs> what it is. And it's brilliant. And I'm are we the trap or are we a finger? I think they're the fingers and we're the trap. I think don't think about it too hard. You know what I'm saying? They've been fingering us for too long. They've definitely been figuring us for too long, metaphorically. I will say I'm I am heartened that there is a movement in this direction. I do not think 20% is enough. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And certainly Great. there needs to be definition of what revenue is, as you just pointed out. Most That's millionaires and billionaires are making money on their assets. So revenue it feels more like what is your gain? And the gains of like their stock prices are never reported, or at least they don't have to pay taxes on them until they sell those stocks. But I do think in terms of OMB and in terms of the Treasury Department, like it signifies a shift. There are some there may be 
a discussion going down. I like that mm -hmm. discussion. I know there are some former hedge fund people also littered throughout this administration. Some former Goldman Sachs folks up in there. But I also know there, there are people who know what they're actually talking about and they actually want to make a more fair tax structure. And this is at a time, I just want to mention this. In two years, the number of, of billionaires in this country has increased and their wealth. So we've got now 704 billionaires in this country and their total wealth increased by 57% to 1.7 by 1.7 trillion dollars. So now their total wealth is reached 4.6 trillion. This is from Americans for Tax Fairness. So they, they just came out with this in earlier in March. Like so much, this is at a time who has more money right now? Who has like more breathing room right now? No, hardly yeah. anybody. And they're like, oh, you're essential and this and that. Oh, we've got to cut costs. Oh, the supply chain. BT dubs were making a killing while you're literally exactly. dying. Exactly. Yeah, doing better. Their their wealth is up, corporations, their their profits are up. So weird how we still end up with higher prices and they're getting more and more money. Yeah, huh? But I'm sure Biden is committed to this. Look, I, I like that. I like that the sorts of promises they'll run on but not really mean are increasingly progressive false promises. That's something, I guess. We'll see how it goes. Um, I hear Joe Manchin wants like $500 billion to deal with the climate. So, you know, good stuff coming in the spring. Clean coal. Anyway, <laughs> clean coal. We're going we're gonna to get it, we're going to clean it. We gotta switch to something else, so let's jump into this next video. After 18 years, this is my final Fox News Sunday. It is the last time, and I say this with real sadness, we will meet like this. But after 18 years, I have decided to leave Fox. I wanna try something new to go beyond politics to all the things I'm interested in. I'm ready for a new adventure, and I hope you'll check it out. So that was Chris Wallace back in uh, the middle of December of last year, announcing that he'd be leaving Fox News after being, uh, you know, an anchor there for about 350 years. And he uh, made it seem as if the main reason was wanting to try something new. He wanted to get into like Real Housewives live reactions or something. I don't know, <laughs> um, but it turns out now he is revealing with a couple months of a buffer after he's moved on from Fox that it actually wasn't about him. It was about them. He says that life became unsustainable there as he starts his new streaming show. Bear in mind, of course, as he slams Fox News, a lot of this is to promote his new CNN streaming show, which we'll get into. But he said that it was unsustainable, increasingly so after the 2020 election, saying I'm fine with opinion, conservative opinion, liberal opinion. But when people start to question the truth, who won the 2020 election was January 6th an insurrection. I found that unsustainable. I spent a lot of 2021 looking to see if there was a different place for me to do my job. He says uh, after Donald Trump lost, a period when the channel ended at 7 p.m. newscast, fired the political editor who helped project a Trump loss in Arizona on election night, which was totally true and the right call to make, and promoted hosts like Mr. Carlson Tucker, who downplayed the January 6th riot. He confirmed reports that he was also so alarmed by Mr. Carlson's documentary Patriot Purge that he complained directly to Fox News management. And uh, although he doesn't go in depth into how that was received and what changes were made based on his complaints, I think we can sum it up as a big old goose egg. They didn't care. It's Chris Wallace versus Tucker Carlson, who's bringing in the money for Fox News. The issue I have, Francesca, is that he is right to point out all of these issues. And Fox has gotten noticeably worse even since that last election. But it's not like they had a strong commitment to the truth 15 years ago. It's not like they weren't warmongers and xenophobes and homophobic and, and all that stuff. So what do you think about his explanation for why he left just a few months ago, he left? I mean, I don't know. I think that he just had a really high, high tolerance for BS uh, and maybe enjoyed the fact that he felt 
smarter than his coworkers. I don't know, but yeah, you're right. Like, I do think there is a demonstrable difference between people like Bill O'Reilly and Tucker Carlson. I think Bill O'Reilly did speak more in dog whistle, and Tucker Carlson just is a walking, you know, whistle. <laughs> and they've swallowed it, and they're just like, <laughs> it's like the when you swallow a squeak toy or whatever. What's from anyway? The point is, <laughs> they're like squeak. It's happened to me. I, I get it. I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know when you swallow a squeak toy? Uh, is that exactly. just me? So um, but, but yeah, so, but he, there's another part in I think his statement of why he left, which is, uh, I guess it took me a while to learn. <laughs> like, yeah, buddy, I think your eyes weren't open. I think you knew kind of what was going on, but yeah, you woke up and people were just floating alternate facts, like Trump actually won the election. And I do think it is scary to say that this person who reported accurately on those election results was summarily fired. Yeah. And Chris Wallace can have his pick of the litter, he can go wherever he wants. Also, he did a terrible job moderating that presidential debate. So <laughs> there's I, also that. I remember it being somewhat mixed. I think he yielded a lot to them, but he is, look, Chris Wallace is 40% of the times Fox News isn't the worst thing in the universe. Yeah. It's like you <laughs> very rarely get a Ducey comment that's okay, maybe a Geraldo. <laughs> but Chris Wallace, he would ask somewhat tough questions. But bearing in mind, it's not that he was ever our ally. He was just a less committed to being horrible Republican. He was an actual Republican. Which meant he probably he held a lot of policy views that we would find abhorrent, a lot of personal views that we'd probably find equally abhorrent. But it, but it wasn't the Tucker Carlson model. It wasn't the Glenn Beck model or anything like that. Well, but and I also think that he wasn't an opinion show. Like, sure, every yeah. question. I mean, I don't believe there can be such thing as objectivity in news. But arguably, the Wallace Chris Wallace's show was much more about asking straight questions and sort of like doing some real reporting. And that's the thing, and it goes with liberal media too, right? Whether or so-called liberal media, um, CNN or or MSNBC, where there is no disclaimer. Hey, now we've started the opinion portion of our evening, right? Mm -hmm. There is no media savvy, so the lines between, oh, this is the NBC that is reporting the news, and this is the NBC that is crafting a very elaborate argument about one thing in particular and you know I don't know like and it's mostly just opinion and panel shows of opinion people like sure. it, it's difficult and I think that Wallace was like the last vestige of actual straight reporting and that honestly as we all know it gets fewer views fewer clicks it, it doesn't it's not confirmation bias and people don't want to watch that stuff they just want to yeah. be told that their QAnon conspiracies are correct but they're beautiful and they smell great and their hair is very soft. That's what they that's what they want to be told. So he was criticized for the the ratings of his show over 18 years. Uh, look, over 18 years, the fact that he never did better, I guess, is an indictment of him. But but it also could be an indictment of the Fox News audience. Maybe the right wing just isn't interested in that stuff. And Fox has moved on, not only from Chris Wallace, but they now regularly will have their straight news programs take clips from last night's Tucker Carlson and discuss them. Jesus. Just like, hey, wasn't that a great point that Tucker made? But that's what his show is. So anyway, Chris Chris Wallace is now doing a CNN Plus series. It's not gonna be for me or for Franny or anything. And I think it's kind of funny that you can so smoothly transition from Fox over to CNN, but whatever. I think it's nice to have a little bit of a look into what seemingly somewhat sane Republicans think about Fox News' course. Yeah, Any I mean, thoughts? Tuck, no, just that's what this show does. Tucker Carlson clips from the night before. They yeah, don't need to do that. Exactly. Well, and we <laughs> don't just agree with him. We try to provide a little bit of context. Uh, thankfully, not today. We do have some baddies, but I don't think Tucker Carlson. Anyway, with that said, I'm not going to risk um, the 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 hazy technical state that we're in. We're going to go to our second break. When we come back, though, we're launching a new segment. So everyone, don't go anywhere. Okay, everybody, let's have a little bit of fun with the 11 minutes we have to close out the hour. Over the, I was a little bit worried we were gonna launch into that. Uh, over the weekend, monsters, true baddies dwell in the shadows, knowing that TDR doesn't go live on Saturday and Sunday to identify their vile deeds. But we are here on Monday, and thus I give you the Monday Menace. <laughs> can take his electric
electric vehicles and his bicycles, and he and his husband can stay out of our girls' bathrooms. Yep. It's not just the delivering of the line, it's the finishing going, yep, nailed it, Margie. <laughs> so that was Mar Marjorie uh, Taylor Greene, uh, Congresswoman uh, some in some ways and not in others. Uh, she was speaking at a rally headlined by Donald Trump. And she is not gonna let him be the most vile person at the rally. So in case it wasn't clear there, Pete Buttigieg and his husband can stay out of girls' bathrooms. Because she doesn't even understand the talking points that are being used. March, March, listen. They've moved on from the outright demonization of gay individuals to some extent. They realize that's not popular. Now they're targeting on a daily basis the trans community as supposedly being predators. When in fact, it is far more likely that they will be assaulted in bathrooms than anyone else. But she just mixes it all up. She knows that she doesn't like Pete Buttigieg. She hates that he's gay and has a husband. And so they are predators now, Francesca. They're going into bathrooms. For little girl, they're gay. They don't want girls of any kind, little or not. There's so much I want to explain to her about the world and how it works. What do you mm -hmm. think? I just love that she threw in like everything, you know, with their bicycles and their vegan cheese and Encanto. And, uh, and they just, <laughs> what? <laughs> their matcha lattes. And their matcha lattes. And they went in there to to be a different gender. Um, you nailed it. <laughs> like like <laughs> anything that is a boogeyman, throw it all in and just mix it up in your cauldron, Margie, and uh, you know sip it and spew it out. That's uh, yeah, it it makes no sense. Um, but yeah, also kind of a teachable moment between gender and sexuality. They mm -hmm. are two different things. Yeah, gay they men. Are, yeah. Gay cis men still identifying as men would not want to be in a girl's bathroom, correct? <laughs> I think it is an opportunity for us to learn. Of course, our audience probably has the least need for learning <laughs> out of anyone, but um, but the people in that audience definitely could. And again, it's the it's the mixing up. Like so, like I know that you want to you want to imply that every gay man secretly is a pedophile, even for the other gender for some reason. But why you gotta throw like the electric cars in there, like? <laughs> why is it gotta take your wind turbines and your cauliflower and your Prius? Why do you have to mix it up? Like the butt. Why do, is she against do your bikes? butt stuff in the Prius? I'm sorry. <laughs> Got a hatchback. Just I don't know. She does CrossFit. <laughs> why is she against exercise on a bicycle? If you can bike to work, that's a great option. Gas prices are through the roof, and she's demonizing non fossil fuel transportation. But it got a pretty good response, not necessarily an amazing response. By the way, this follows on from a recent tweet that we didn't ever read, but where she had said, We don't have this. The Taliban is closing schools for girls above sixth grade. Democrats are replacing girls with boys and girls' sports. They both have no respect for girls or women. Don't try to do foreign policy, it's not your strong suit. I don't know what is your strong suit, but it ain't that. And just like, we, we, she's our Monday menace because we want you to know that the, the outright demonization of the LGBTQ community never ends. Newsmax was attacking Pete Buttigieg for having kids. Recently, the right was attacking Dave Rubin and his husband for adopting. Like Dave Rubin, that yeah. is the only thing he's done in years that isn't offensive. And that's the thing you attack him for? That's a perfectly fine thing that he did. But they're, they're attacking. Pete Buttigieg for taking paternity leave. Look, for them, Pete Buttigieg is a convenient way to attack gay men and have plausible deniability. Pretend that it's just about Pete Buttigieg. It's not about their homophobia, which it very much is. No, and it is. And I think the Dave Rubin stuff was incredibly revelatory to yeah. say that, look, the Republican Party, and I think even the MAGA movement to some extent, um, you know, has tried to actually co-opt um I think like a certain amount of like pro LGBTQ plus uh language, you know, like, well, yeah, it's not really about um, you know, your personal identity. It, it is about your politics. And uh we accept specifically uh gay cis 
uh, white men. Like we're we're into that. Like that's fine. I mean, remember Milo Yiannopoulos had his moment, and there have been um, there have been others who've been like sort of right wing stars. And no, man, there's a ceiling. There is a ceiling if you are gay and you are on the right. And guess what? Um, It's Roe v. Wade now, but they're coming for marriage equality. Mark my words, with this Supreme Court, even with the confirmation of Ketanji Brown Jackson, they're coming for Augerfeld. I agree. Um, And they're gonna overturn it. They just will. It's going to, I mean, it's going to happen unless we mount a defense against it. But again, with these Democrats, uh, very difficult. Exactly, yeah, there's no there's no proactive defense. It's just another thing they'll fundraise off of. We do have to go into one of the weirdest little brief stories. Let's jump into this video. Sexual perversion that goes on in Washington. I mean, it, being kind of a young guy in Washington, with the average age is probably 60 or 70. And I look at all these people, a lot of them that I, you know, I've looked up to through my life, I've always paid attention to politics, guys that, you know, it, then all of a sudden you get invited to like, well, hey, we're gonna have kind of a, a, a sexual get together at one of our homes, you should come. And I'm like, what, what, what did you just ask me to come to? Yeah. Uh, and then you realize they're asking you to come to an orgy. Yeah. Uh, or, or the fact that you know there's some of the people that are leading on the movement to try and remove you know, addiction in our country. And then you watch them do you know, a key bump of cocaine right in front of you. And it's like, wow, this is, this is wild. Did he say a kilo of cocaine? Well, a key, was, bump, uh, key bump. <laughs> key bump. Okay, I, I don't know the terminology. I haven't been invited to such fabulous parties. Anyway, that's Madison Cawthorn. Uh, maybe telling the truth. We're going to debate it briefly. Uh, talking about people he looked up to. So presumably Republican politicians, maybe Republican lobbyists. I don't know. But people in DC, he doesn't sound like, like this sounds like a QAnon thing. That there's these elite sex parties. But he said he looks up to these people. So I'm assuming they're not Democrats. What do you think, Francesca? Is because he's a massive liar. Is he being asked to come to orgies by these Republican politicians? I mean, sh- sure. You know what I mean? Like, I super believe it. Lindsey Graham, I mean, tell me you're not talking about Lindsey Graham. Hello. Uh, I think the, Graham for sure. Anyone who mentioned the words child pornography uh, during the hearing of Katanji Brown Jackson, they're definitely um, key swapping as well as key bumping. Uh, shuddering, I like, like part of me is just like, I need to go puke now thinking of some of these senators and Congress people oh. in any kind of like orgy situation. Like I just imagine them with their like sort of like knobby knees and tall socks and just, you know what I mean? Walking around. Socks with like stay their, on. Full yeah, floors. socks are always on. It's just, it's just a, a Rudy Giuliani because you just look, there's a lot of weirdos in, in, in DC and there's, and there's a lot of money. And every time there's money and power, you're gonna have Coke and orgies. It's probably gonna happen. That's true. Thus, me not experiencing either. Uh, okay, so we're not sure, but um, he's supposed to be brave, right? These are establishment Republicans that don't share your values. So why are you being so vague and anonymous? Why don't you name some names, Madison Cawthorn? And you know, I, I have a lot of zeal, I have a lot of charisma, I've got a, a lot of uh, aggression, and I don't, never back down. I'm happy to take those things on, but I realize, I'm 26 years old, I don't have a, a whole lot of wisdom at this age in my life. Uh, so I was very happy to get to team up with Speaker Newt Gingrich and have him get to help. So then, like, why are you there? Like, if you you attribute to yourself, I think, in a weird way. Okay, you have zeal, I guess. You're trying to indicate that you're a religious wacko and you're aggressive. Sure, you love to threaten political violence and everything. Um, you have a lot of charisma. Okay, I'll leave that to your base or whatever. Uh, but if you don't believe that you have wisdom, why would you think that you should be the representative in Congress for hundreds of thousands of people? Like, think about that. You're supposed to have humility, by the way, if you're a Christian. So he is humble enough to know that he doesn't have wisdom, but thinks that he should lead all of these people. And look at all the missteps, Francesca. Just crazy scandals throughout, like a lot of them involving calls for further insurrections, gun stuff. He doesn't have wisdom. He's accurate in that, but it's consequential. I wish he would take it more to heart. Do I think? don't know. I, I think it's great. I think Madison Cawthorn's being, you know. Just fully transparent. Look, I am, uh, you know, um, I'm an empty vessel, and you can fill me with whatever nonsense. You, Russia, <laughs> hell yeah. Uh, January 6th stuff, well, let's take that too. I got a little bit of Gingrich. You just fill me up, and I will, I will literally just repeat anything you tell me to repeat. I'm a parrot. Yeah. Like I like that. Like, Basically. you know, someone's being a little honest <laughs> about it. For um, once. 
But he shouldn't uh, be in office. Okay. No, he shouldn't be in any position of authority. I wouldn't trust him to manage employees. Anyway, we got a lot more to get to. Don't go anywhere. Help minute break. Francesca and I will be back after this. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.